Hello and welcome to Premier Advisor Live. I'm Tommy Ratliff, Senior Associate of Government Affairs and Communications at Premier. Today's Advisor Live webinar will focus on the CMS proposed rule to update home health payment rates for calendar year 2020, temporary transitional payments for home infusion therapy services, and changes to the Home Health Quality Reporting Program. In this Advisor Live, Shara Siegel, Director of Government Affairs at Premier and Innovatix, and Brad Kyle, President of the Dumbarton Group, will provide a deeper dive into various components of the proposed rule. We are recording today's call. You'll be able to watch the recording by visiting the newsroom section of premierinc.com later this week or on the Premier News and Announcements Premier Connect community. We will also notify you via email once the recording is available for viewing. We've set aside an hour for today's event and we'll be taking your questions at the conclusion of the program. You can submit a question at any time by using the questions and answers space on the left-hand side of your screen. We will answer questions at the end of the program. It's now my pleasure to welcome the two presenters for today's presentation, Shara and Brad. I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Tommy. We're really excited to be here and provide the latest updates on the home health and home infusion rule. We've outlined our agenda here today on the rule. We'll start with key takeaways, dive into the home infusion provisions, discuss the home health prospective payment system, and get under some of the payment proposals there, cover the HH value-based purchasing model and the quality reporting program, and talk about the regulatory impact of the rule and save some time for questions and answers. So let's go over some of the key takeaways. So this rule came out on July 11th. Comments are due to CMS by September 9th, and Premier will be submitting comments. The proposed rule makes updates to the Medicare coverage of home infusion therapy services, the home health prospective payment system, the home health value-based purchasing model, and the home health quality reporting program, and we'll dive deeper into those elements. CMS estimates that the net impact of the proposed policies would be an increase of 1.3% or $250 million in Medicare payments to home health agencies for 2020. The overall impact of this model is an estimated $378 million in savings over five years from the reduction in unnecessary hospitalizations and skilled nursing facilities usage. We wanted to start out with the latest updates on the Medicare Home Infusion Therapy Services benefit that is included in the rule. And to understand where we are today with the home infusion portions of the rule, let's review the legislative and regulatory context. So back in 2003, when Congress passed the Medicare Prescription Drug Improvement and Modernization Act, most drugs covered under the Medicare Part B space moved from an average wholesale price to an average sales price methodology. But Congress purposely carved out Medicare Part B DME-infused drugs to acknowledge the gaps in Medicare coverage for home infusion therapy. And I should note that here we're only talking about the Medicare Part B benefit. And so historically, the service component of home infusion drugs had neither been covered in Medicare Part B or D. But as Congress started to look into the high cost of prescription drugs, it came back to this average wholesale price for Medicare Part B DME-infused drugs. On December 13, 2016, President Obama signed into law the 21st Century Cures Act, which was a broad sweeping bill, but it included two provisions for home infusion providers. The law changed the payment structure for infusion drugs under the Medicare Part B DME benefit from an average wholesale price to an average sales price payment methodology effective January 1, 2017. The law importantly included a long sought after policy to create a Medicare payment for the professional services associated with home infusion therapy, but it unfortunately did not start until January it was not anticipated to start until January 1st, 2021, creating a lengthy and inappropriate four-year gap in implementation from the time that drug payment cut went into effect and the services benefit date. Premier and the infusion community have long advocated for the simultaneous creation of a new home infusion service benefit to appropriately address Medicare's coverage gaps for infusion therapy. And we worked aggressively with the National Home Infusion, infusion Association and other infusion providers to raise concerns about that four-year gap in services coverage. After working on this for over a year with our congressional and committee champions, we were pleased that Congress passed a measure to bring that services benefit date up two years, so going from 2021 to 2019. Unfortunately, CMS had a different and very narrow interpretation of how they would interpret 
Congress is in, in passing that legislation. The final, they finalized a rule in October 2018 despite receiving comments from hundreds of stakeholders and more than 40 members of Congress that, defi and that defines an Infusion Drug Administration calendar day for the Home Infusion Therapy Services temporary benefit as the day on which home infusion therapy services are furnished by skilled professionals and the individual's home on the day of infusion drug administration. Those on the webinar know that many important services occur outside the home, and this policy runs counter to how home infusion is delivered. They issued another proposed rule on July 11th, the one that we'll go deeper into now, and I circled that because that's where we are today. And that makes updates to the transitional benefit and lays out the permanent benefit. CMS still maintains its definition of infusion administration calendar day. And we'll dive deep into the rule now and talk a little bit more about the industry's current strategy to try and address CMS's position towards the end of this section. So moving into the temporary home infusion services benefit, the information on this slide should look familiar because the temporary payment benefit went into effect on January 1, 2019. Under the transitional payment system, in effect for 2019 and 2020, home infusion drugs are assigned to three payment categories based on the HCPCS codes for the drug administration. So category one covers intravenous drugs for therapy, prophylaxis, or diagnosis. Category two covers subcutaneous infusions for therapy or prophylaxis, and category three covers intravenous chemotherapy infusions. And CMS created a new HCPCS G code for each of the three payment categories and finalized the billing procedure for the temporary transitional payment for eligible home infusion suppliers. In this rule, CMS proposes to update the temporary transitional payments for 2020 based on the CPT code payment amounts and the 2020 physician fee schedule that they've noted are not yet available. And as I mentioned, they make no changes to their definition of infusion drug administration calendar day. They still maintain a skilled professional needs to be in a patient's home for reimbursement to occur. In this rule, CMS lays out the scope of the permanent benefit and conditions for payment. CMS proposes to define home infusion drugs as parenteral drugs and biologicals administered intravenously or subcutaneously for an administration period of 15 minutes or more in the home of an individual through a pump that is an item of DME covered under the Medicare Part B DME benefit. Services covered under the home infusion therapy benefit are intended to provide teaching and training on the provision of home infusion drugs besides the teaching and training covered under the DME benefit. CMS proposes to require that home infusion therapy services be furnished to an eligible beneficiary by a qualified home infusion therapy supplier that meets health and safety standards. The agency proposes that qualified home infusion therapy suppliers ensure that a beneficiary meets certain eligibility criteria and ensure that plan of care requirements are met. CMS proposes that a beneficiary must be under the care of a physician, a nurse practitioner, or physician assistant, and that a beneficiary be under a plan of care established by a physician. The physician's orders for services must include the type of home infusion therapy services, the type of professional, as well as specify the frequency with which the services will be furnished. A qualified home infusion therapy supplier is a pharmacy, a physician, or other provider of services, or supplier licensed by the state in which it furnishes items or services that must Furnish infusion therapy to individuals with acute or chronic conditions requiring administration of home infusion drugs. Ensure the safe and effective provision and administration of home infusion therapy on a seven-day-a-week, 24-hour-a-day basis. Be accredited by an organization designated by the secretary and meet such other requirements as the secretary determines appropriate. CMS does not enumerate a list of professional services that may be necessary for the care of an individual patient. The rule specifies that no payment can be made for Medicare services under Part B that are not reasonable and necessary for the diagnosis or treatment of illness. Payment for an infusion drug administration calendar day is a bundled payment, which reflects not only the visit itself, but any necessary follow-up work or care coordination provided by the qualified home infusion therapy supplier on days in which professional services are not being provided in the home. Care coordination furnished by the DME supplier responsible for furnishing equipment and supplies including the home infusion drug, is paid for under the DME benefit, and care coordination furnished by the physician who also establishes the plan of care 
is separately billable under the physician fee schedule. So it keeps that DME benefit and the payment for the physician separate. So more on the permanent services benefit. CMS proposes to carry forward the three temporary transitional payment categories that we spoke about earlier for the home infusion therapy services payment in 2021, except it now proposes that payment equals five hours of infusion per day rather than four hours, which is a slight improvement. The law indicates that the payment cannot exceed four hours per day under the transitional system and five hours per day under the permanent system. CMS proposes to increase the payment amounts for each of the three payment categories for the first visit by the relative payment for a new patient rate over an existing patient rate using the physician evaluation and management payments amounts for a given year. If a patient receiving home infusion therapy services is discharged, there must be a gap of more than 60 days in order to bill a first visit again. CMS states that it will monitor home infusion therapy service lengths of visits in order to evaluate whether the data supports the payment increase for the first visit. Though paid for under the transitional benefit, CMS indicates that it would exclude hyzentra, ziconitride, and fluoroxidine for the permanent benefit. The permanent benefit. And CMS proposes to adjust the single payment amount by the physician fee schedule geographic adjustment factor. The proposal would apply the geographic adjustment factor to the home infusion therapy single payment amount based on the zip code of where the beneficiary is receiving the service. CMS does not believe that prior authorization for home infusion therapy services is necessary at this time as services are contingent on the requirements under the DME benefit. CMS will monitor the provision of home infusion therapy services and revisit the need for prior authorization if issues arise. Also, the agency does not believe that high cost outlier payments are necessary at this time and plans to monitor the need for such payments and potentially address in future rulemaking. CMS also discusses billing procedures for calendar year 2021 home infusion therapy services. CMS continues to believe that as a qualified home infusion therapy supplier is only required to enroll in Medicare as a Part B supplier and is not required to enroll as a DME supplier, it is more practicable to process home infusion therapy services claims through the AB Max and the multi-carrier system for Medicare Part B claims. CMS plans to require that home infusion therapy suppliers submit all home infusion therapy service claims to the Medicare A, B, Max. DME suppliers concurrently enrolled as qualified home infusion therapy suppliers would need to submit two claims. One claim for the DME supplies and DME drugs to the DME Max, and two claims for the professional services to the A, B, Max. CMS stated that it plans to issue a change request with more detailed instructions regarding billing and policy information for home infusion therapy services when it releases the calendar year 2020 final rule. So I wanted to end this section with a note on our strategy. Premier has long advocated for comprehensive home infusion reform and we will continue to do so. We were out of the gates with a press release when the proposed rule was issued on July 11th raising strong concerns with restricting payment to when a skilled professional is in the patient's home and noting that it runs counter to the administration's goal of decreasing healthcare spending and improving access to care and thereby improving patient outcomes. Inside Health Policy and Healthcare Finance News picked up the story. And so where are we now? With CMS remaining unwavering in their position, the National Home Infusion Association filed a lawsuit on February 14th, challenging the administration's definition of infusion administration calendar day. Right now, the industry is waiting on the judge to set a date for oral arguments, and it's really at the judge's discretion, but we're hoping for resolution in early fall. Premier filed comments on August 31st, December 28th, and we will again on September 9th. Throughout the process, we join meetings with CMS and on the Hill to raise concerns about the impact on beneficiary access, safety, and cost. We are currently working with NHIA and Congress to introduce and pass a resolution that would clarify congressional intent that reimbursement was intended for each infusion administration calendar day or the day an infusion drug enters a patient's body, not when a skilled professional is in a patient's home and limiting it to just that. While a resolution does not carry the weight of law, it would set a marker about Congress's intent in passing the services benefit in case we do need legislation in the fall. Also, the resolution would not hurt the legal arguments that NHA is putting forth and it doesn't generate a CBO score, which should make it easier to pass. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Brad for the next part of the webinar.
Brad? This is the operator. His line actually disconnected, so just uh, one moment, please, and I'll dial right back out to him. Okay, great. And we do have Brad Kyle reconnected. Please go ahead. Thanks, folks. I apologize for that uh, brief interruption here. We're going to start and go through this home health rule, moving beyond just the home infusion that Shara went through. There is a quite a bit going on in this rule. So we're going to take this in three different parts. We're going to start uh, with a really monumental shift that we're seeing in home health, and that's this new patient-driven grouping model uh, that we're going to walk you through. This uh, goes into effect here for 2020, and it's a, a seismic shift in the way home health will be paid more broadly. And we'll walk you through all of the techno technical elements on that. And I'll spend most of my time today in the presentation going through exactly that, our current system that we have and how this transition to the PDGM uh, will occur and some of the technical information underneath that. We'll take a deep dive there. And then we'll go into the home health value-based uh, purchasing. We'll uh, highlight some of the changes that uh, are in this proposed rule for that. And then we'll turn it over to Shara. has got some uh, updates for you on the quality reporting program or the QRP. So let's take a look at this uh, patient-driven uh, grouping model. It uh, is very familiar to, I think, probably many of you that CMS is trying to re-engineer a lot of the different payment models for skilled nursing care, and here we have it for home health, and we see this in other elements as well, moving away from paying just for resources and trying to realign incentives to uh, focus on quality and outcomes, so really working through that. So we'll draw some parallels as we go through here today, what we're seeing in this home health patient-driven grouping model with what we're seeing, for example, over on the skilled nursing facility side with some of the changes there as well. Let's take a look at some of the bottom line numbers that are here for that. Uh, we see overall this market basket, that's the global update uh, for home health for 2020 that's being proposed. And we've got a couple differences here for that. I just wanted to highlight there is a policy already in place uh, that penalizes those home health agencies or HHAs that you see there uh, that don't report the required data. So there's a 2% uh, differential on that. There's a 2% penalty, if you will, for failure to report added adequately for that. So when we take a look globally overall, the um, rule here proposed projects about a 1.5% increase uh, for those that are reporting appropriately, and then about a half a percent reduction for those that are not. And Shara mentioned earlier, but it's worth highlighting here, overall CMS is uh, projecting an increase of about $250 million during 2020 for home health agencies. That's an increase of about 1.3% on average. So most of those changes are going to be due to some of the technical ways in which the CMS is proposing to change home health payments. So let's get into that and take a look underneath of what is going to happen here in 2020. Now we mentioned this is just a proposed rule and we'll be expecting a final rule for CMS uh, relatively shortly uh, that will set things in motion for 2020. But what we can tell you today that this uh, patient-driven grouping model, this is a done deal. CMS last year uh, went through rulemaking to finalize some of the provisions in 2018 that will actually go into effect with 2020. So the proposed rule we're looking at in front of us here, we've got some pieces of information we think CMS may or may not tweak when they issue a final rule, but we can tell you with 100% certainty this patient-driven grouping model, it's set and they're ready to go with it um, from here. So some of this information, home health um, uh, agencies, they, they learned last year with the final rule, but now that we're narrowed in and focused on it and just uh, less than six months out from the initiation date, let's go underneath it. And, and what we'll walk you through here are, are some of the information that we've got now in the proposed rule that we can tell you definitively. So 
just to get us uh, oriented, we have this current prospective payment system in home health. It's based on 60-day episodes. So currently, we've got 153 uh, category case mix classification system. Uh, it covers those health, home health disciplines, um, but excludes some non-routine supplies. Those are paid separately outside of that. So broadly, that's our current PPS system. And then January 1, we'll be going to this PDGM. This is going to be a significant change just in the days in the episode. So 30-day episodes is what we'll have with the PDGM with 432 unique case group mixes. And uh, these rates will have folded into them. They are inclusive of non-routine supplies. So one of the big takeaways from today for this section on the PDGM is this shift that home health will go through starting in January. 60-day episodes is what we're, we've been experiencing and currently have, and now we're moving to 30 days. And, and you can look and see just the number of categories, the 153 with our current system versus 432 uh, with the new PDGM. You can see that this will uh, attempt to be much more targeted, much more refined. And again, it all ties back to the more global initiative that we see across different payment systems at CMS to move away from paying uh, for care broadly and getting more specific to outcomes and quality, really tying into the patient's needs. And so I'll walk you through a model here in just a few slides of how CMS believes we're going to get there with this PDGM to refine what it is the patient is needing based on their condition and a number of other factors, and then tying the payment to that. So let's take a look here, um, this HHRG, these home health resource groups. Uh, again, we've got 153 category, uh, categories from them. This is driven currently off of three different components. So you've got the functional severity, clinical severity, and then a service utilization um, component for it as well. And so this covers those, those rates, includes the different home health disciplines, the skilled, the home health aid, physical therapy, speech language pathology, occupational therapies in there, as well as medical social services. So those are all pulled together for that. I do want to mention, too, because we're going to tie back to it in a few slides, um, under our current system, within a 60-day um, pe uh, period, uh, those episodes that have four or fewer visits during that 60-day, they're not paid the lump amount for the 60 days of care. That defaults over to a per-visit rate. So if there are four or fewer, they don't get the full amount. They get a per-visit rate. So if there are three, then they would get those three-visit payment amounts times the national rate for that. This is something known as the LUPA, L-U-P-A, or Low Utilization Payment Adjustment. So in our current system with 60 days, it's four or less. Let's just hang on to that thought for a moment because we're going to come back to it at the end and talk about how we deal with low utilization payment under the new system, the PDGM for that. And again, we've got five components here that are going to help give us the 432 different groupings, timing, admission source, clinical grouping, functional impairment, and then the comorbidity adjustment. And I'll walk you through each of those in, in just a, a few slides here. These uh, case mix weights, they're generated for each payment group. And then CMS is going to update what those payments are annually through rulemaking, through proposed rule and final rule from that. And you see here on the slide just a link if you want to get into uh, the details. We know many of you have seen the releases from Premier. We've got the full reg, of course, but we've provided a summary. And then hopefully these slides also will help you drill down a little bit more. On the next slide, what you'll see here is this uh, patient-driven payment model, just the overall, uh, this is figure one actually from the rule that walks you through the different admission source and then timing, clinical group, and then functional impairment, comorbidity. That's how we're going to get there. And so let's go through each one. Let's talk about timing here. So the timing criteria will be early or late. Uh, the first 30-day period will be classified um, as early for all those, and all subsequent 30-day periods will be late for that. Uh, CMS does tell us in this proposed rule uh, that a 30-day period is not going to be classified as early unless there's a gap of greater than 60-day period uh, from the end of one of the periods to the start of another. And we know here, and CMS is, is real clear in this proposed rule, that there are many instances where individuals are certain certified for home health, and then they will go off of that home health benefit and then come back on. So CMS is saying here for an early period, it's always going to be that first 30 days, but the uh, caveat there is if there's not a gap of 
greater than 60 days uh, for it, it won't be considered early. And so that's our first level, first derivative of this classification system. And then the second here is the admission source. And that this has two uh, different uh, models for it. The community or institutional is uh, how those will be coded for it. So each 30-day uh, period will be classified depending on the, the setting utilized by the beneficiary 40 days prior to the start of that. And so we know uh, the institutional criteria will be met if that uh, patient was in acute or a post-acute care stay. Also, uh, CMS has put here in the proposed rule so another caveat here. So the patients with acute hospital stay during the previous 30-day period that are also within uh, 14 days prior to that sub sub subsequent uh, contiguous 30-day period, uh, those will also be considered institutional as well. Again, what CMS is addressing here is these uh, different gap periods as well. They also go into some great detail in this proposed rule. They uh, really don't want in any of these home health agencies to game the system to discharge or change the setting of patients they're currently uh, providing care for in order, in order to work through whether or not they would be institutional or our community. So they've set this parameter in there as well. As well. And then of course, all other folks that don't meet those first two levels of criteria, they will be coded as coming from the community setting for their admission source. All right, let's keep going through this model then. We've got the clinical grouping uh, model for it. So CMS has developed what they've called the interactive grouper tool. Um, this will include all ICD-10 diagnosis codes uh, used in the model. And uh, the home health agencies, what they will do is this will be interactive for them. You see the link there that um, CMS has set for this tool. So home health, home health agencies will use that tool, interact with that in order to generate information about where the patients come in on their clinical grouping. And this, again, is all going to be tied to the ICD-10s in order to get that clinical grouping criteria. And then the fourth criteria here is the functional impairment level. Um, the, the coding for this will be low, medium, or high. This is based on OASIS functional items. Those of you in home health are very familiar with OASIS. That stands for the Outcome and Assessment Information Assessment. This is a longstanding tool that's been available and used in home health in order to generate an assessment of the functional impairment level for the resident for that. And so they will uh, utilize that on a low, medium, or high based on that functional level. Um, so the, the o OASIS items are grouped together in response categories with similar resources. And CMS provides a lot of detail in this uh, final rule that came out last year for this, for those of you who are interested in getting down into that uh, level of detail for it. It will be the same, um, the, the functional level for the first and the second uh, periods unless there's a significant condition change during that period that uh, gets coded as other follow-up under the um, OASIS assessment. And then there can be a change for that second 30-day period of care. But the way this is set up, if the patient is low for the first 30 days, uh, there presumably will be low for the second 30 days unless there is that uh, condition change that triggers a change for the functional impairment coding. And then let's move lastly here to the comorbidity adjustment. And the code and levels here are low, high, or none. Um, there's, this is an adjustment that can be made based on the secondary diagnosis um, for that. So low scoring uh, folks here would have a secondary diagnosis falling in one of the home health uh, categories associated with higher resource use. A high score here would be two or more um, secondary diagnoses associated with that as well. And then, of course, patients that don't qualify for low or high, there would be no adjustment for them. In the proposed rule, CMS lays out that a 30-day period can receive either adjustment, but no single-day 30 period would receive both adjustments as low or high um, for them. CMS mentioned they're, they're going to update in the final rule, which, again, we expect here in, this, in the coming weeks on this, uh, once the comment period closes and CMS has looked at it, they will give an update on those comorbidity subgroups and the interactions that they're looking for on that. Presumably, this will be something they look at each year and update through rulemaking for that. So again, let's talk about this LUPA. I mentioned it earlier under our current system. It's when you have four or less visits when, within a 60-day period. Now under PDGM, we're moving these 30 days. What CMS is proposing to do is set that threshold at two, um, or they've uh, also allowed a 10th percentile value or a threshold 
for each group. So each of those different groupings based on the data CMS has will have a different and varying LUPA threshold for that. So two uh, will be sort of the standard that's out there, but based on the experiences CMS has and that threshold um, for that, that will uh, be completely dependent upon the grouping in which the patient falls. So this is something that home health agencies are really going to have to stay close to on that. Of course, if the LUPA threshold is met, then um, the home health agency, they'll get paid that full 30-day episode amount based on the grouping that patient is in. If that is not met, the threshold is not met, then payment will default to a per-visit amount, which will be set in regulations. So that was a lot to walk through, but I think it was uh, – hopefully it was valuable for you folks. So I wanted to just spend a moment to sort of recap and really put it all on one slide where you can see how this PDGM will be working. Again, we look at the five different criteria with timing being the first. Is it early or late? You've got an admission source, an institutional or community. Then you've got these very critical clinical groupings, which are based on the ICD-10 diagnoses. We've got a functional impairment as our fourth level here, which is low, medium, or high based on our OASIS assessment of that patient. And then finally, you've got this comorbidity, which some folks will get none on if, if they don't have secondary diagnoses that uh, translate here, or there may be a low or a high. And again, no 30-day period would get a both low or high. It would be one or the other for that. So this is the PDGM, which again is rolling uh, forward and will be in effect for January 1, 2020. The transition gets a little tricky here, so let's uh, take a little snapshot to look at how this transition will work. Uh, that column that you see to your far left, that's the easiest one uh, to explain and understand. For care uh, periods beginning on or after January 1 of 2020, we simply are flipping the switch. We're going from that 60-day episode of care, so everything in that category will move to a 30-day episode of care for those beginning on or after January 1. And then you see here in the middle those care periods that began on or before uh, Jan December 31st and that will end before February 28th, those will have the 60-day payment rates apply. So that's how that transition will work. Uh, for those periods, it will be that full 60-day payment uh, rate that carried through 2019 into 2020 for that. And then those care periods that uh, meet that same criteria, they began, they began before the end of uh, the year uh, for that, but are uh, that LUPA uh, episodes, those low rates, they will get paid at the national per visit rate for that. That will be the default. So we've got three different categories of transition here. Again, the easiest uh, one to understand is those that start January 1 and forward uh, will be in this 30-day uh, model. Those that started just before will have this transition period, which will close out uh, right at the end of February. So I wanted to shift off of this uh, groupings model and just talk about a couple policies that are in this proposed rule that affect more broadly um, home health. And there are two of them in here that CMS is proposing and looking to get finalized. The first deals with an expanded scope of practice for therapy assistance. Uh, under this proposal, it would allow therapist assistance to perform maintenance therapy. Um, so under that maintenance program established and have an oversight by a qualified therapist um, for that. And CMS, CMS is also saying that the therapist assistant must be uh, performing this service under the scope of practice at the state licensure level. So there'll be some variation based on the patchwork of state laws there, whether the therapist assistant uh, is able to do that based on the state scope of practice for it. Under this proposal, CMS still maintains that qualified therapist is still responsible for the oversight of that maintenance therapy, as well as responsible for the broader care, including initial assessment, developing that plan of care, um, the overseeing the, the maintenance program and modifications, and the reassessment um, every 30 days for that. So that's a proposed change on therapist assistance. Uh, and then we also see a proposal here, which I think many um, home health agencies will, will look very, very favorably upon. CMS is proposing to change the regulatory text within the care plan requirements um, that are there. And so under this, uh, what they would do, they would revise the text to allow these individual um, care plans not to be as prescriptive and also as punitive from there. So they're changing the language more broadly to allow the HHAs to make sure that these care plans meet the patient's needs and are identified with comprehensive assessment um, for that. 
But really the motivation here for CMS is to really address concerns about the prescriptive language in the current uh, framework for that that are causing timely payment issues for home health agencies. So there's been a lot of claims denials, a lot of um, uh, audits that have gone on, a lot of appeals that have needed to go on here. And so what CMS is wanting to do with this is really let these any violations with care plans overall, let those uh, be dealt with when you uh, or looking at the survey process and the oversight process as opposed to the rejection of claims, the denials, and the appeals. Most of you are really aware of this, I'm sure, but we have our uh, appeal system, certainly with healthcare coming out of HHS more generally, is log jammed right now. So when a claim is denied and the, the full appeal process takes place going all the way to the administrative law judge, in some instances we're talking about five or more years of a backlog there. And so this is an area CMS is wanting to address, and that's their motivation behind this care plan regulatory text change that they've gone forward. Got one last issue for you, and then I'll turn it back over to Cheryl. I want to talk about the Home Health Value-Based Purchasing Program. Of course, we do have a lot of value-based purchasing uh, applied to many other settings that we see across uh, healthcare. We've got it, of course, in the skilled care and the acute care for hospitals, et cetera. But just by way of background, um, this home health value-based purchasing, a little different than those other settings I mentioned. Um, with home health value-based purchasing, this started in uh, 2016, but uh, came through the, C the CMS Innovation Center. It's a five-year test, and it's limited to just the nine states that you see there. And under this uh, program uh, for that, there are financial incentives and disincentives uh, for home health agencies in those nine states. There's a performance year. The first one of this model is 2016. Uh, any uh, evaluation of the performance of home health agencies there, they're evaluated against their peers as exceeding or not exceeding for that. Um, there was a 3% adjustment, and that could be upward or downward. So it's a reward or a penalty system. And that's on a sliding scale. That moves all the way to 9% adjustment when we get out to performance year five. So there's a lot of dollars at stake here with this value-based purchasing program for those agencies operating in those nine states. In this proposed rule, CMS uh, goes out and says, we, uh, we believe we're still on target for that projected $378 million in savings over the five years of this um, program that they're doing for value-based purchasing. And they go on to say, we're not going to change anything in this proposed rule for this next year, going into 2020. They'll, they'll maintain uh, the different assessment tools that they're using um, to uh, evaluate the home health agencies in those nine states for their performance. However, they are proposing to take public and publicly report on their website um, those home health agencies that qualified for a payment adjustment in 2020. So that's uh, an adjustment upward or downward um, that is out there. And we went ahead and left you the link here for that if you want to check out more about value-based purchasing uh, in those nine states, whether that's your service area or not, but are just interested on how this may go. Uh, you can take a look there and uh, presumably after that adjustment's made in 2020, were this policy finalized, you would actually be able to look and see those agencies that receive the upward or the downward adjustment based on this value-based purchasing. Conventional wisdom tells us that uh, CMS is, as they go through this uh, five-year test in the nine states, that there certainly may be a move in the future to make this permanent and then have that value-based purchasing apply to all states and all home health agencies. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sharis to talk about the quality reporting program. Thanks, Brad. We wanted to um, provide some information on the quality reporting program before getting into some of the resources that are available for you and how to submit comments. Let's dive in. This slide should look familiar because CMS is trying to standardize reporting requirements and measures across post-acute settings. So there's overlap in what CMS is putting forward for home health agencies, skilled nursing facilities, inpatient rehabilitation facilities, and long-term care hospitals. For year 2022, CMS proposes the addition of two new process measures beginning with 2022 under a new quality measure domain entitled transfer of health information. Additionally, CMS proposes to update the specifications for the discharge to community post-acute care home health quality reporting program measure in order to exclude baseline nursing facility residents from the measure. 
CMS proposes to remove the measure improvement in pain interfering with activity beginning with 2022. So the two new process measures for 2022, the transfer of health information to the provider post acute care and the transfer of health information to the patient. And so the measures calculated as a proportion of home health quality episodes with the discharge or transfer assessment indicating current reconciled medication list was provided to the subsequent provider at discharge or transfer. And so we've explained how the denominator and numerator will be calculated and the slides will be available if you want to get more into that. And we also want to note that the transfer of health information to the patient is calculated the same way, except the measure is whether the reconciliation was provided to the resident, family, or caregiver at discharge. So for the discharge to community um, measure, CMS would exclude the baseline nursing facility residents from the measure beginning with 2021. The baseline nursing facility residents are defined as home health patients who had a long-term nursing facility stay in the 180 days preceding their hospitalization and home health episode with no intervening community discharge between the nursing facility stay and qualifying hospitalization. CMS is currently using the minimum data set assessments to identify baseline nursing facility residents. And so in the 2018 Home Health Perspective Payment System Rule, CMS had proposed to require home health agencies to report 23 spades, these standardized patient assessment data elements, but only um, ultimately finalized two of them. Commenters had concerns that CMS was moving too quickly and the spades needed further testing. So here, CMS moves forward with two of those and makes some additions. So the proposed standardized patient assessment data elements that they're proposing to begin in 2022 are functional status, cognitive function and mental status, specialized services, treatments, and interventions, but they add a high-risk drug class, class category, which we'll get into more in a bit. Um, also, medical conditions and comorbidities, and they add pain interference, impairments such as hearing and vision, and other categories as deemed necessary by the secretary, and they mentioned social determinants of health is added, and we'll get more into that. So also on here, there's a request for information uh, on the home health quality reporting quality measures, measure concepts, and standardized patient assessment data elements, which, is, which will be under consideration for future years. Um, and so CMS is seeking comments on the importance, relevance, and appropriateness and applicability of the following spades that we've listed out here. Um, and CMS noted that they're not going to respond to these comments in the final rule, but they will be considered in future policymaking. So let's get into the newly proposed spades. So first, the high-risk drug classes, use, and indications. This proposed new data element would ask at admission and discharge whether the patient is taking any medications in six specific drug classes, and if so, whether there is an indication noted for all the medications in the drug class. And so the six drug classes that we're talking about here are antipsychotics, anticoagulants, antibiotics, opioids, antiplatelets, and hypoglycemics, including insulin. In describing its proposal, CMS cites the literature on the potential adverse effects associated with these drugs and discusses comments that received from stakeholders during the development process. They're also proposing to add pain interference, so the pain effect on sleep, pain interference with therapy activities, and pain interference with day-to-day -day activities. They are also proposing a new category of spades, the social determinants of health, and would collect data on the social determinants of health using existing PAC data collection mechanisms. CMS describes the requirements in the Impact Act for the Secretary to assess adjustments to quality and resource use measures to reflect social risk factors, including establishing new data sources. And so just the seven elements we've listed out here and just wanted to end on the impact analysis of the Home Health Quality Reporting Program. CMS estimates that the average increase in costs resulting from the proposed addition of SPADES and the two quality measures would total $170 million annually beginning in 2021 across 11,385 home health agencies or $14,923 per home health agency. A two percentage point reduction to the annual home health market basket percentage applies to home health agencies that fail to meet the home health quality reporting pro 
requirements as Brad mentioned earlier. Also, CMS proposes to remove question 10 regarding communication about the pain from the Home Health Consumer Assessment of Providers and Systems Surveys, or the Home Health CAP Survey, beginning July 1, 2020. And so that question is, in the last two months of care, did you and a home health provider from this agency talk about pain? CMS provided rationale for that and said that removing this question is to avoid potential unintended consequences that may arise from its inclusion in the survey. And they say that the proposal is consistent with the removal of pain questions from the hospital cap survey, as well as the proposed removal of the measure on improvement in pain interfering with activity. And so the last slide is a recap of the re regulatory impact analysis. And we've been stating these numbers throughout the presentation, but CMS provides this regulatory impact analysis because the proposed rule is a, what they deem a major rule that meets the threshold of an economic impact of $100 million or greater. And so CMS estimates that the net, net impact of the home health per, um, payment per, perspective system policies in this rule are an increase of 1.3% or $250 million in Medicare payments to home health agencies for 2020. And with that, I wanted to just note that there are a number of resources available for you for more information on this. We included links, so when you download these slides, there are links to the CMS documents and also resources that Premier and Innovatix has put out. And we, of course, encourage you all to submit comments that could be more tailored and specific to some of the feedback that you have for CMS and feedback impacting your businesses. And we've laid out how you can submit comments. And so again, those comments are due 60 days from the date that this came out. So they're due on September 9th. And there are two ways that you could submit comments. You could go to this link up here where we've linked proposed rule. And you'll see a green button on the right-hand side of the page that says submit a formal comment. And you can click on that to submit comments or you could go to www.regulations.gov, type in the rule number, which is CMS1711-P into the search box. You'll, that'll pull up a series of rules and at the top it should have this one, the calendar year 2020 home health prospective payment system rule. And so you click on that and then click on comment now, at, which is the blue button to the right of the title. And with that, this is Brad and my contact information please reach out with any questions, comments, feedback. We'd love to hear from you. And with that, I will open it up to comments, to questions. Great. Um, we are ready for questions now, and I'll ask our operator to give everyone a brief overview on how to submit questions over the phone. Thank you. If you would like to register a question, please press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone. You will hear the three-tone prompt to acknowledge your request. If your question has been answered and you would like to withdraw your registration, please press the 1 followed by the 3. Again, to register for question on the phones, press the 1 followed by the 4. One moment for the first question. And as a reminder, you can also submit questions through the question and answers area on your webinar, webinar home screen on the left-hand side. Um, and if we do have a slew of questions come through today and we can't get to everyone, we'll make sure to follow up via email. Um, at the moment, there are no questions online, and we'll see if there are any on the phone. I have no questions on the phone ones at this time, but as a reminder to register for a question, press the 1-4 on your telephone. We'll give just a minute to see if we have any questions, and if not, then we'll conclude our presentation here in just a moment. And Mr. Rattle, just let me know that I have no questions on the phone lines. Okay. And I have none on the online Q&A session either. So I think that will probably do it. We've come to the end of our time today. We hope this program has been helpful and appreciate you spending the time with us. Um, as mentioned, uh, Brad and Shara's contact information is now showing on the screen if you happen to have any additional questions or feedback about today's event. We also ask that you'll take a moment to answer the brief survey questions and let us know how we can better serve you. We will have today's recording posted very soon on the newsroom section of premierinc.com, and we'll send an email whenever that is ready. Thank you again for joining us, and have a great rest of your day.